and then we'll get into it. Heavenly Father, God, thank you, uh, Lord, for this uh, evening that you blessed us with. God, thank you for the, the time of worship that we've got to share in. And Lord, tonight, as we look at uh, Deuteronomy 5 and 6, um, Lord, it's the repeat, or I guess I should say the reminder in Deuteronomy chapter 5 of the Ten Commandments. And as we look at those um, as a church, Lord, and talk about, Lord, how your law and your word is perfect, and um, Lord, that it's true and that it's right, um, just teach us, uh, Lord, from your word, by your spirit this evening. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So as we uh, continue our study through the book of Deuteronomy, we're remembering that that word uh, means the second law or the repeat of the law because Moses now has this uh, next generation of Israelites that he's getting ready to lead into the promised land. The first generation all died off in the desert except for Joshua and Caleb. They got to stay alive because they were the only two uh, that came back with a good report from when they went and spied out uh, the promised land. Uh, so Joshua and Caleb get to stay alive from that first generation. Everyone else will slowly die off until you just have the next generation in which Joshua will then lead over into the promised land. And we'll get into that when we get to the book of Joshua, which is after Deuteronomy. But at this point, Moses, they're camped on this side of the promised land, on this side of the Jordan River. And he's just reminding this next generation about God's faithfulness, about um, God's law and his commandments and kind of what he's done up to this point so that they can know uh, before they get into the land that God has promised them. So in chapter 5, verse 1, it says, And Moses called all Israel and said to them, Hear, O Israel, the statutes and judgments which I speak in your hearing today, that you may learn them and be careful to observe them. Uh, there's kind of three things that we see in verse number 1 that uh, the Lord through Moses is telling his people to do. He says, I want you to hear. He says, I want you to learn. And I want you to observe. He wants them to hear the statutes and the judgments, or in a broader sense, we can just say his word. He wants them to hear his word. He wants them to learn his word, and he wants them to observe, or we'll use the word obey his word. Uh, hear my word, learn my word, and obey my word. Now, why would God want his people to hear his word? Well, because in Romans chapter 10, verse 17, Paul says, so then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So as God's people hear God's word, it's actually going to grow them in faith. So he tells them, I want you to hear my word. He also says, I want you to learn the statutes. Now, learning is a little bit different than hearing. He says, I want you to really know it. I want you to probably even memorize some of it. I, I want you to understand it. I don't just want you to hear it. I want you to be able to understand it and, and really, really know what it's about. And then lastly, he says, I want you to be able to observe it or obey it. And in James chapter 1, verse 22, James says, uh, when it comes to the word of God, we need to not just be hearers, but we need to be doers also. If all we do is hear God's word and don't do it, he says, we're like a man that looks in the mirror and we see that our, uh, face is all messed up, and we just forget anyway and go out and about our day, is essentially what James's point is there in James chapter 1. But it's important that we hear, learn, and obey the word of God. Verse 2 goes on to say, then the Lord our God made a covenant with us in Horeb. Now, it's interesting that phrase in verse number 2, the Lord our God made. That word made in the Hebrew, it's literally uh, cut. The Lord our God cut a covenant with us. And when you study uh, what would happen when they would make covenants, Back then, that, that's a very interesting word that the Lord uses because um, I think back when God made a covenant with Abraham, actually, yeah, mm, I don't know actually, now I don't want to go there because I can't remember the story. I think it was Abraham or it was Jacob and one, he just keeps them asleep. They're asleep, he takes this, uh, this cow, he cuts it in half and they're sleeping the whole time. God cuts the cow in half, and he passes through it. Whereas traditionally, if you were making a covenant with someone else, you and the other person would pass through the center of the covenant, signifying that if either of you broke the covenant, uh, what happened to this animal would be your future. What's significant about that is when God made that covenant with whoever it was, go back and read Genesis, and you'll figure out who it was. <laughs> when he made that covenant with the guy in Genesis, he realized... Um, he made the guy fall asleep, which means the covenant is not contingent upon our end of things. It's on God's end of things. So God has cut a covenant. He's made a covenant with the children of Israel. Notice we're at the end of verse number two, Horeb, 
or we call that place Sinai, same mountain. Horeb and Sinai are the same place. Verse 3, and the Lord did not make this covenant with our fathers, but with us, those who are here today, all of us who are alive. Now, I really like the attitude, actually, of this next generation because God made the covenant with their fathers. Most of these guys weren't even alive when the Lord gave the Ten Commandments to Moses back in Exodus chapter 20, but they take ownership in it. They go, these laws, these commandments that God gave our ancestors, even though he directly gave them to them, they're actually not for them, they're for us. So this next generation was able to see the importance, they like took the word of God personally. And I like this, because sometimes when we read this book, we can be like, yeah, this stuff is for those people back then. But this generation is like, no, even though God spoke to our ancestors these Ten Commandments, man, we're taking ownership in this. And that should be true for us as well. Even though this stuff was written for those people back then, we can have ownership in how it applies to us today. Verse 4, it says, The Lord talked with you um, face to face, this is speaking of Moses, on the mountain from the midst of the fire. And, And I stood between the Lord and you at that time to declare to you the word of the Lord For you were afraid because of the fire, and you did not go up the mountain. Uh, He said, and it'll go on to say, but notice how Moses describes this relationship there in verse 5. He says, I stood between the Lord and you at that time. As Moses is up on the mountain of Horeb, Sinai, the children of Israel down at the base. God's giving him the Ten Commandments. And Moses says, I acted as a bridge. We could use the word mediator between God and the people. Now, the New Testament tells us that there's only one mediator between God and man, and that is Jesus Christ himself. And Moses is a type, he's a picture, he's a model of Jesus in the Old Testament. And this is a great example of that. Moses acted as a mediator for the people, between the people and the Lord, and Jesus Christ acts as our mediator. Verse 6 says, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt out of the house of bondage. Before God is going to, or before Moses is going to repeat to them the Ten Commandments, uh, as we see back in Exodus chapter 20, uh, the Lord reminds them of who he is and what he's done in verse number six. He says, just so we're all clear, before I give you my top 10 list of commandments, I want you to be sure you understand that I am the Lord your God, uh, the one who brought you out of the land of Egypt and out of the house of bondage. I'm the one who is God. I'm the one who delivered you and brought you out. So he kind of establishes who he is. And he goes, because I did those things for you, because this is who I am, now here are my standards. Now, the order of this is not coincidence at all. Because notice in verse number six, he says, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt. The children of Israel were delivered. The children of Israel were redeemed first. And then the law is given. Redemption comes first, and then obedience takes action. Uh, We see the principle right here in the Old Testament. He says, you are already redeemed. He's not giving him the Ten Commandments so that they can become redeemed. He says, you are already a redeemed group of people, and now that you are redeemed, now that you're no longer slaves in Egypt, here's how I want my people to deal with things. Now, before we get into these Ten Commandments, um, Let's just be sure we understand them because a lot of, even a lot of Christians get really confused at how the Ten Commandments apply to us today. Um, we know that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever, and the Ten Commandments really give us a good overview of the heart of God. But in Exodus chapter 20 and Deuteronomy chapter 5, only 10 are listed, but in the entire Old Testament, there's actually 613 commandments. So these are kind of the summary of those 613 commandments. Nowhere throughout the Word of God do we ever see that the law of God uh, saves anyone or that the law of God redeems anybody. So the purpose of the law is that it would point us to someone. But before we get to that, we need to realize what James says in James chapter 2, verse 10. Because some people will read the Ten Commandments, and in a self-righteous way, they'll say, well, I'm doing a pretty good job. But in James chapter 2, verse 10, James says, if you've broken one of God's law, you've broken all of them. And the best way to kind of explain how that works is imagine if there's a chain, a 10-link long chain, and you're dangling from it, and one of those links break. It doesn't matter which one breaks. Guess what? You're going down. If you've broken one of God's laws, you've broken all of them. 
So the purpose of the Ten Commandments is not necessarily that we would obey them completely because we know that ultimately that's impossible. So what is the point? In James chapter 1, verse 23... James actually gives us the answer, and he uses a beautiful picture to describe it. James says in James 1.23, For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in the mirror. I referenced this earlier. He says, For he observes himself, and he goes away, and he immediately forgets what kind of a man he was. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it, and is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this one will be blessed in what he does. James says we can use the word of God, the law of God, as a mirror. Now, when you wake up in the morning, and you look into the mirror, and you realize that the night was a little rough on you, let's say it that way, right? You realize you had a bit of a rough night, and your hair is a bit messy, and your face, you still need to paint it on and stuff like that, right? You still got some work to do. Here's the interesting thing. When I look in the mirror, and I see my messy hair, the mirror cannot wash my hair. The mirror cannot comb my hair. The mirror just shows me what needs to be done. The law of God is the mirror. It shows us what needs to be done, but the solution is not found in the law. Where is it found? Galatians. Uh, Paul tells us in Galatians chapter 3, verse 24, he says the law is a tutor, is a schoolmaster that actually points us or leads us to Christ. The law of God, including the Ten Commandments, works as a mirror. It shows us that our hair is messy. It shows us that we need to brush our teeth, but you can't brush your teeth with a mirror. You can't fix yourself with the law. That shows you the problem, that you're fallen short, that you're sinful, and then that's a schoolmaster, that's a tutor, that shows you that Jesus is the solution that's going to fix your problem. So, so that's what the purpose of the law is. So in verse number 7, we see the first commandment listed, and these are in the same order as Exodus chapter 20. He says, you shall have no other gods before me. The first commandment that God gives his people is you can have no other gods before me. Essentially, God's saying, I'm the one and only, and I don't want you having anything else in front of me. In the New Testament, Jesus would say in Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, that he wants us to seek first the kingdom of God. God wants to be first in our life. God doesn't want second place. God wants first place in our life. So the first commandment is, hey, no other gods besides me. The second commandment in verse number eight is you shall not make for yourself any graven images or any uh, of any likeness of anything that is in the heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the waters under the earth. You shall not bow down to them nor serve them for I, the Lord, your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me but showing mercy to thousands to those who love me and keep my commandments. The second commandment is no graven images. Now, coincidentally, um, the Catholic Church leaves this commandment out, and I find that fascinating considering they're the church that has a lot of graven images. And what they do is they omit this one, and the final um, commandment, do not covet, they split that one in half so that it makes up for the one that they drop out. So they, they leave out graven images and they say, don't covet your neighbor's wife, commandment number nine. Don't covet your neighbor's goods, commandment number 10, equaling a total of 10, yet leaving this one out. And the reason why they do that is because uh, back in the Back in the day when um, Augustine uh, was writing, that's how he interpreted it, and they followed along. Actually, the Lutheran Catechism follows the same uh, events. They leave out uh, the no graven images part, and I just find that to be fascinating. Why does God not want his people to have images of him? Uh, have you ever been tagged in like a really bad picture on Facebook? Right? We hate bad pictures of ourselves. Guess what? God doesn't like bad pictures of himself, and there's no picture out there that'll satisfy him. There's no statue out there that does him justice. So he says, just don't have it, right? It's embarrassing. <laughs> verse, uh, notice there in verse number nine as he's describing this, uh, why he doesn't want them to have these graven images. He says, you shall not bow down to them nor serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. We talked about this last week, but again, it's just the idea 
that God wants all of you. He doesn't want part of you. He doesn't want to share you. He actually wants all of you. In verse 11, we see the third commandment. He says, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Now, when we read about that third commandment, taking the name of the Lord in vain, um, our first mind probably goes to a profanity when people like um, blaspheme the name of God. Um, but there's several ways in which someone can take the name of the Lord in vain. It can be profanity or blasphemy, but another way of doing that is by um, attaching his name to stuff that he's not a part of, or if you are claiming to be a bearer of his name, and you're not being consistent with what he's consistent with, in a way, you're taking his name in vain. And that word vain, it means emptiness, vanity. It's common. It, there's no weight to it. It's, it's, it's weightless, whereas the name of God is powerful, we know. Um, so it's, it's taking, it's the opposite of reverence. Instead of reverencing the name of God, it's so common that it actually becomes nothingness. Verse 12, the fourth commandment. He says, observe the Sabbath day to keep it holy, as the Lord your God commanded you. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but on the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. And in it you shall do no work, you, nor your son, nor your daughters, nor your male servants, nor your female servants, nor your ox, nor your donkey, nor any of your cattle, nor your stranger who is, in, who is with you, who is within your gates, that your male servants and your female servants may rest as well. This is an interesting commandment that God gives his people because for 400 years in Egypt, his people never got one day off. And now he almost has to force them to take a day off. He goes, here's the deal. You are going to not work one day out of the week. Now, there's some Christians today that get caught up with this commandment. All of the Ten Commandments are listed again in the New Testament except for one, and that's the Sabbath day. Because we actually learn in the New Testament about the Sabbath day, how Jesus fulfilled that in a very unique way. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. But there's some Christians today, they get caught up on the Sabbath day, and they say, well, the Sabbath day is on Saturday. And they're completely right. The Sabbath day is on Saturday, it's not on Sunday. If you think Sunday is the Sabbath, you're wrong, okay? <laughs> Let's just get that out there right now. Sunday doesn't need to be the Sabbath, okay? Sunday is the day that Jesus rose from the dead. Sunday is the day... The Holy Spirit came upon the church, so that's why the early Christians started meeting on the first day of the week. The Sabbath is still Saturday. Saturday has always been the seventh day. It'll always be the seventh day. God rested on the seventh day, but people will try to beat up Christians who do not go to church on the seventh day or observe the Sabbath and say, well, you're not following the Ten Commandments. And if anyone tries to give you a hard time about this, look at them and say, how many days a week do you work? And most of them only work five. And say, well, the Bible says six days you shall work and the seventh you shall rest. So how about this? If you want to honor the Sabbath, work six days and then we'll talk, right? Because they only follow half of it and they think they're self-righteous. It's like, no, dude, you don't understand what the commandment says. Six days you shall work. And by the way, a day in the Jewish calendar, sun up to sundown, 12 hours, which is a half day right? Because there's 24 hours in the day. So that's only a half day of work, 12 hours. People get all impressed when they work 10 hours. It's like, that's not even half a day, dude. <laughs> Put in some more time. <laughs> anyway, work for six days. On the seventh, you shall rest. Why? Because if you, work for, if you work for seven days, it'll make one week. W-E-A-K. If you work for seven days, it'll make one week. So God says you got to take at least one day off to rest. Work your heart out. Work your guts out for six of them. But on that seventh one, my people need to take a break. This is something that would separate the children of Israel from every other culture during that time. No other pagan religion had this concept of the Sabbath day. Now, what do we know about the Sabbath day from the New Testament? In Mark chapter 2, verses 27 through 28... Uh, these guys come up to Jesus and his disciples, and they're giving them a hard time. They're religious guys, Pharisees, and they go, you all are walking through a, a, corn, a grain field, and you're picking heads off the grain and eating it. Uh, you shouldn't be doing that because today's the Sabbath, and that's work. And Jesus looks at them and says, here's the deal. Um, Sabbath wasn't made for man, or man was not made for Sabbath. The Sabbath was made for man. And by the way, in case you're curious, I'm Lord of the Sabbath. So he's like, uh, leave me and my guys alone, is essentially what Jesus tells these uh, 
uh, Pharisees, and they kind of shut their mouths and they leave them alone. But we learn from the New Testament, one, that Jesus is Lord of the Sabbath. In Colossians chapter 2, verses 16 through 17, Paul says, don't let people judge you in feasts and new moons and Sabbath days. Why? Because those things are shadows, but the substance is Jesus, is Christ. Right now, I'm casting a shadow here. The shadow, you can kind of tell it's me. You can see my tie flopping, but you can't really understand what it is because the shadow is just a shadow and myself is the substance. Jesus says that's how the Sabbath day works. It's a shadow of something. It's a shadow of a principle I want you to understand about peace and rest, but the substance is found in me. And that answer is Ephesians chapter 2, verse 14, when Paul would say that Jesus Christ is our rest. Literally, Jesus is our Sabbath. So Jesus fulfilled the Sabbath day and that our rest is found in him, meaning that we can cease from the labor because we don't have to work for our salvation because uh, of the finished work of the cross. Uh, Deuteronomy 5.15 goes on to say, and remember, still talking about the Sabbath day, and remember you were a slave in the land of Egypt and the Lord your God brought you out from there by a mighty hand and an outstretched arm before the Lord your God commanded you to keep the Sabbath day. He reminds them of where they've come from. He reminds them of how far he's brought them. Hey, when, when you're having a hard time taking a day off, when you're having a hard time remembering, God says, here's the deal. Remember, you were once slaves in Egypt. You once didn't get a day off for 400 years. And I'm the God that brought you out of Egypt with a strong hand and an outstretched arm. So if you're having a hard time, just remember how far I've brought you, the Lord would say. Verse 16, we see the fifth commandment. The first four commandments, by the way, deal with our relationship with God. The last six deal with our relationship with man. Uh, or the Yeah, verse 5, or commandment 5, verse 16, he says, Honor your father and your mother. This is a good one for some of these kids in the room. Honor your father and your mother. And guess what it says? It's the only commandment with a blessing. Honor your father and your mother as the Lord God has commanded you that your days may be long and that it may be well with you in the land which the Lord your God is giving you. Only commandment that promises a blessing. Honor mommy and daddy. Why? Because they know what's best. Now, obviously, um, that's not saying necessarily that you're going to live a really long time, but you're going to live a a good life. Your, Your life Hey, kids, can I give you some advice? Your life will go easier if you listen to your mom and dad, okay? That's what God's point is here in verse 16. Verse 17, which is commandment number six, he says, you shall not uh, murder. And that is an accurate translation. Uh, Some translations say kill. Um, That's a too broad of a term. We see throughout, already throughout the New or the Old Testament up to this point, God has actually commanded killing on certain levels. So this is not necessarily just killing, but this would be murdering, taking innocent life. Verse 18, the seventh commandment, he says, you shall not commit adultery. Um, That's a good one as well. It's important for us not to be uh, committing adultery, which would be um, if you're uh, cheating on your spouse. It reminds me of a story that um, this little Sunday school uh, student asked uh, his teacher, and he misunderstood the Ten Commandments. As they're going through them, he goes, what does it mean to not commit agriculture instead of adultery? And another little kid raised his hand and says, it means that you only plow your own field. And it's the same point with agriculture and adultery, right? Only plow your own field. (laughs) Uh, Verse 19. (laughs) Verse 19, we see the eighth commandment. He says, you shall not steal. Uh, God's okay with us having stuff, but God wants us to work for the stuff that we have. He doesn't want us taking stuff that we didn't rightfully earn. Verse 20, the ninth commandment. He says, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. Um, tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. I find it interesting in our court of law, we make people swear that they're going to tell the whole truth, uh, the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, and they put their hand on a Bible and swear that. We should be doing that all the time. The truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Because if you tell the truth, half the truth, and uh, some more of the truth, you can just, expanding on stories, leaving information out, that's uh, that's um, a form of lying if the if, the, if you're using the truth to manipulate how the situation actually took place. Verse 21, the tenth and final commandment, he says, you shall not covet your neighbor's wife and you shall not desire your neighbor's 
house, his field, his male servants, his female servants, his ox, his donkey, or anything that is in your neighbor, that, or anything that is your neighbor's. The last one deals with actually contentment. He says, I don't want you coveting what your neighbor has. Meaning God says to his people, I want you to be content with what I've given you and what you've uh, what I've allowed you to make with your life. Instead of always looking over across the yard at your neighbor's nice, nice lawnmower or, or trying to keep up with the Joneses, he says, that's not what I want you to do. He says, I don't want you coveting stuff. But it's interesting because we live in a culture uh, where uh, that's what's pushed down all through. Advertisement is about trying to get us to covet stuff so that we buy things. And that's not the case. It's so easy for us to look at other people's lives and other people's situations and be like, wow, how come it seems like the grass is greener on the other side? Well, probably because it is. But here's the deal with green grass. It takes a lot of fertilizer to get it green. So the reason why their grass is greener than yours is because they put up with a lot more crap, okay? So it's not as good having green grass sometimes. Have you ever seen a cow in a field? It's, it, it's springtime. It's May. They got grass up to here, and they got their head through the fence eating on the other side. It's like it makes no sense. But that's how we can be as God's people sometime. And he says, I don't want that. I want you to be content. I don't want you coveting what's on the other side of the fence. Verse 22, he says, These words the Lord spoke to all the assembly in the mountain from the midst of the fire, the cloud and the thick darkness, with a loud voice. Uh, he added no more, and he wrote them on two tablets of stone, and he gave them to me. So Moses just lets that generation know, he gave me these two stone tablets. That's how we got them. These are his commandments. Verse 23, so it was. When they heard the voice from the midst of the darkness while the mountain was burning with fire, you can read about that, uh, this back in Exodus 20, that you came near to me, all the heads of your tribes and your elders, and you said, surely the Lord our God has shown us his glory and his greatness, and we have heard his voice from the midst of the fire, and we have seen his day uh, that God speaks with man, yet he still lives. Now, therefore, why should we die? For this great, fire, this great fire will consume us. If we hear the voice of the Lord our God any more, uh, then we shall die. For who is there of all flesh who has heard the voice of the living God speak from the midst of the fire as we have and lived? Verse 27, he says, you go near. This is the multitude speaking to Moses. They hear, they see lightnings, they see thunderings, it's dark, it's cloudy up on Mount Sinai. The multitude freaks out. They go, uh, Moses, we're scared to hear from God. You go up and you hear from him. That's what verse 27 is talking about. They say, you go near, speaking to Moses, and you hear all that the Lord God may say, and tell us all that the Lord God says to you, and we will hear it and do it. Now, I like what they say there at the start of verse number 27 when they say, you go near and hear you know, oftentimes in order to hear God, we need to get near to God. In order to hear him, we need to get near to him. I, I, I have hearing issues. Uh, when I was a kid, I had to have like four different sets of tubes in my ears. And in my right ear, I like built up scar tissue on my uh, eardrum. So in fifth grade, they went in and they like regrafted me a right eardrum. So I've always had um, hearing issues, but I can't hear that. And uh, so especially in crowds. So what drives me crazy is when someone's on the other side of the room and they're trying to speak to me. It's like, no, if, in order for me to hear you, I need you to be near. In order for us to hear God, we need to come near to him. And that's what Moses does up there on Mount Sinai. Verse 28, it says, And the Lord heard the voice of the words when you spoke to me. And the Lord said to me, I have heard the voice of the words of this people, which they have spoken to you, and they are right in all that they have spoken. Verse 29, the Lord says, Oh, that they had such a heart in them, that they would fear me and always keep all my commandments, that I might do well with them and with their children forever. You can almost hear the emotion in God's voice as he says there in verse 29. Oh, uh, that they had such a heart in them that they would fear me. God is just almost like kind of lamenting, like if only my people. It reminds me in uh, Matthew chapter 23, verses 37 through 39, when Jesus is up looking over the city of Jerusalem and he's weeping over it and he's just like, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, if only you know this day was for you. It's the same kind of heart we see uh, from the Lord back here in the Old Testament. Verse 30, he says, go and say to them, uh, return to your, I'm just going to use the handheld mic real quick, actually. Uh, 
Uh, there we go. Yes. Okay. Um, Exodus chapter, or Exodus, Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse number 30, he says, uh, Go and say to them, return to your tents. But as for you, stand by me, and I will speak to you all the commandments and the statutes and the judgments which you, shall, which you shall teach them, that they may observe them in the land which I give them to possess. Therefore, you shall be careful to do as the Lord your God had commanded you, and you shall not turn aside to the right or to the left. I like the end of verse number 32. Man, be careful you do what God tells you to do, and do not turn aside to the right or to the left. What does that mean? Stay in the middle. Keep going forward. Don't get distracted. Don't go this way or that way. Uh, don't, don't freak out. I find it interesting that the way we describe political parties are right and left. Notice what the Word of God says. Do not go to the right or to the left. Just keep going straight, right? Verse 33, he says, You shall walk in all the ways which the Lord your God commanded you, that you may live and that it may be well with you, and that you may prolong your days in the land which you shall possess. So in Exodus chapter, uh, what book are we in? Deuteronomy chapter 5, in Exodus 20, it's pretty much the same thing. That's why I'm confused. But in Deuteronomy chapter 5, we see a, a summation of the Ten Commandments. As we get into chapter 6, a pretty famous chapter in the book of Deuteronomy. It says, now this is the commandment, and these are the statutes and the judgments which the Lord our God has commanded to teach you that you may observe them in the land which you are crossing over to possess, that you may fear the Lord your God to keep his statutes and his commandments which I commanded you, you and your sons and your grandsons, all the days of your life, and that your days may be prolonged." He says, man, when you cross the Jordan River into the promised land in verse 2, he says, see that you fear the Lord your God. Now, we've talked about this before, but we often equate the emotion of fear as a negative thing with like terror or uh, that type of thing. But the fear of God is something the Bible talks about quite a bit. A lot of people say when the Bible talks about a fear of God, it's, it's meaning reverence, and that's true, but there's a deeper meaning to it. Um, and it's not afraid like, oh, you know, um, I'm scared God's going to come down on me, but it's in the sense of that God is completely holy and we are completely not, and that should just freak us out a little bit. We should have a, a certain fear and respect towards God uh, because there's such a chasm in between our two characters. Verse 3, it says, Therefore hear, O Israel, and be careful to observe it, that it may be well with you, and that you may multiply greatly as the Lord God of your fathers has promised you. A land flowing with milk and honey. Now, when the Bible talks about the promised land being flowing with milk and honey, it's actually not talking about bees' honey. Uh, in the, uh, over in Israel, honey would be like date nectar from like dates. So that's kind of what it's referring to. But a land flowing with milk, prosperous for your livestock, and, and really good produce as well is essentially what that statement means. So the land flowing with milk and honey. Now Deuteronomy chapter 6 verse 4, very famous verse from the Old Testament. Uh, it says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Verse 5, And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. That word that verse number four starts out with, which our English Bible translates here, in the Hebrew, it's the word Shema, and that's what this section of verses is known as. It's known as the Great Shema. And uh, faithful Orthodox Jews, even till today, start their day quoting this, and they end their day quoting this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. It's kind of the creed of Judaism. And in it, it's jam-packed of... It's actually, if, if, if you were reading this in Hebrew, you would think that I wrote it because it's jam-packed with, um, with grammatical issues because <laughs> I just don't know how to use my grammar, as you can tell, and it's even worse when I write, but it, it, it's, it's almost as if a child wrote it because it doesn't make any sense grammatically, and let's pick it apart here as I explain it to you. This is something that... Um, if, if you talk to a Jewish person, you explain to them that you're a Christian, they're going to accuse you of being polytheistic, and they're going to say, and they're going to quote you this verse, emphasizing that the Lord our God is one. First, they say here, the word Shema, or Shema, I pronounce it Shema, though, uh, it means here, and this is the, 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 
the prayer that they pray daily. Hear, O Israel, the Lord. Now notice that word Lord is capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. It's the tetragrammaton. It's the name of God. It's not just like the Greek word Adonai that means master. This is the name of God. But because the Jews were afraid of taking the name of God in vain, they wouldn't even write out the name of God. They would just write the consonants and leave out the vowels. So it's the it's the Yahe Vavhe, the Y H W H, uh, tetragram, whichever you want to call it. But um, Jehovah, Yahweh, one of the pronunciations is close to correct. But this is the name of God that's being used here. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God. That word God is Elohim. El means God. Uh, Elohim is actually God's, it's plural. And several times throughout the Old Testament, the plural tense is used, uh, Elohim, to describe the Lord, our God. But it says the Lord, our God, is one. And that word one, it's, it's the Hebrew word akkad. It's, um, it's the same word that's used. I just did a wedding today. It's the same word that's used back in Genesis chapter 2, verse 24, when it says, and the two shall become one. The two shall become akkad, which is, it's a compound unity. So as you look at this verse, it's weird because you have a singular, the singular name, Yahweh, is plural, and there's a compound unity to it. It only describes the Trinity. That's the point that I'm trying to make. Uh, as you just read it out grammatically in the Hebrew, it doesn't make sense. There's more to it than just one being. There, there's some diversity to this that, that the Old Testament is fuzzy in, but when you get to the New Testament, it makes perfect sense as we understand the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It's like when Jesus commissions his disciples at the end of the Gospels. He says, I want you to go forth, and I want you to baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. In the Greek, the name of is singular. It's not, I want you to baptize in the names of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. No, he says, I want you to baptize in the singular name of the three. So again, we see that compound unity of the doctrine that we as Christians known as the Trinity. So, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. This is a pretty famous passage. Jesus quoted from this passage in the New Testament. In Mark chapter uh, 12, verses 29 through 30, a, a lawyer actually comes up to Jesus and asks Jesus a question. Now, one thing we know about lawyers is they only ask questions they already know the answer to. But this guy probably got a surprise when Jesus responds to an answer that he's probably not expecting. This lawyer comes up to Jesus in uh, Mark chapter 12, verse 29, and he asks him, what's the greatest commandment? And this is Jesus' response to the greatest commandment. He says, the first of all the commandments is, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul. And then Jesus adds in in the New Testament with all your mind and with all your strength. This is the first commandment. Interesting. Scribe, Pharisee, lawyer comes up to Jesus. Jesus, what's the greatest commandment? Jesus doesn't name one of the top ten. He names the Shema. The greatest commandment is there's one God and you need to love him. I like this because Jesus' response to the greatest commandment is that you need to be in love with God. And I like this. He doesn't go, no graven images, don't commit adultery, don't be stealing. No, he says the greatest commandment, number one, is you need to be in love with God. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. This is interesting because that term soul there uh, in the Hebrew and the Greek, it's the idea of breath. Love the Lord your God with all of your breath. That's what we're called to do. And I just breathed in the mic when I said that, so that was clever. With all your breath. <laughs> so here we see the Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. One of the very first things that young Jewish children will ever say, their first words are the Shema. Their moms, as they're rocking the babies, repeat this over and over in their ears. It's a big deal in Judaism. Verse 6, carrying on the context of this Shema, it says, And these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. 
I like this. These words, they're, they're meant to go deep. They're meant to be a part of you. Verse 7, and you shall teach them diligently to your children, and you shall talk to them when you sit in your house and uh, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. These commandments, these words, my principles, my word, the God, uh, God says, are to be taught to your little ones when? When you're sitting down in your house, when you're walking, when you're laying down, when you're rising up. I like this because essentially what the Lord tells his people is when it comes to you teaching the next generation spiritual truths, you're to simply just do it as you go. You don't sit them down and say, okay, now, little Johnny, I'm going to teach you about this. And that's not a bad thing. But, but God's heart is just as you're going through life, teach your kids, teach people about spiritual truths. As you're walking, as you're lying down, as you're rising up, as you're doing that, just talk about it and, and have those open conversations. Verse uh, number eight, he says, you shall bind them. As a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontals between your eyes, and you shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. He says, I want my word, I want my commandments to be bound to your hand. I want them to be as frontals to your eyes, and I want you to, to have them on your doorposts. Now, the, the heart behind this that God is communicating is I want my word to be on the forefront of your mind. I want my word to be what's leading you, what, what you're thinking of first. I want my word to be on your hand, meaning when you're doing stuff, I want it to be about the kingdom and the glory of God. I want it on your door, doorpost. I want your house to be a place that glorifies the Lord. But Orthodox Jews have taken this verse and applied it literally, and they have these things called phylacteries, which is the, the Greek term. The Hebrew term is teflon, T-E-F-I-L-L-I-N. Teflon or phylacteries. And I have some pictures here that John's going to pull up for us uh, describing what these phylacteries or these Teflon look like. So the one here, uh, they're, they're little um, wooden boxes, and inside the wooden boxes, they would have scrolls. And these scrolls have to be even today handwritten. They cannot be typed up or fo photocopied. They need to be handwritten. And inside this box are uh, four sections of scripture. Exodus chapter 13, verses 1 through 10. Exodus chapter 13, verses 11 through 16. Deuteronomy chapter 6, what we're reading right now, verses 6 through, verses 4 through 9, and Deuteronomy chapter 11, verses 13 through 21. And what they do is they take the one and they put it on their less dominant arm, so they can use their dominant arm to put it on. They take the one, and they put it in on their elbow, and they wrap the metal uh, strap down their arm seven times, seven times around their arm. Then they take the excess leather, they wrap it around their hand, and then they grab the box for the head. And they take it, and they put it, he says, on the frontal between the forehead. It's up above right above the hairline, and they tie it around back their head, right at the base of the skull, they put the knot, and they take the excess leather, and they run it down their shoulders, symbolizing the word of God that's on their forefront of their mind. It goes through their head, and it runs down their body. Very nice and symbolic. And now, after they've got the one on their arm, which is on their less dominant arm, and it points in towards their heart, how the word is supposed to be in our heart, he said there in Deuteronomy chapter 6. They wrap it seven times down the arm. They wrap the excess around the hand. They put the one on their head. Then they go back to the hand one, and they wrap the remainder around the middle finger, signifying the word of God going through the mind to the heart, out to the hand, working it out, working out, doing the word of God, not just hearing, not just learning, but actually doing it. This is... Um, this is what young Jewish boys get at their, one of the things at their bar mitzvahs. They get these teflon. Um, they, they get their, their robe with their tassels as well as uh, their phylacteries. Now, Jesus told the, uh, the scribes in the New Testament in Matthew chapter 23, verse 5, he goes, you guys are off base because you have these huge teflon and these long tassels, but you ignore the word of God. So back then it appears that the the game was who can have the biggest box on their head, right? It, my box is bigger. I'm more holier than you. Jesus goes, you completely missed the point of Deuteronomy chapter 6. The next picture has, it's just an IDF soldier with one on. I just thought that was cool. 
Um, this is something that they would do. Uh, it's very, um, it's a big deal for the Jewish people even today. Um, in that next verse, though, it talks about verse number nine. He says, you shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. That word doorpost in Hebrew is mezuzah. Now, the next picture is a picture of a mezuzah. A mezuzah is a small box, um, could be wood, could be like ceramic or metal. And inside this mezuzah, they would also place these scriptures and they'll place them at their doorpost. Every Jewish home, Orthodox Jewish home, has a mezuzah not only on the outside door, but on every inside door that's used for, um, for um, I'm trying to think of the way that they word it, because it's kind of funny. The point is they don't put one on the bathroom door, but on the bedroom doors they will, because the bathroom scene is like un unclean. So they put it on every door that's seen as clean. So on the outside door, it always tilts slightly in. And you just see it up here. It's very small. And every Jewish home um, has one trying to be obedient to this verse. Now, that the point is not that you're supposed to necessarily literally have this, but it's that your, your house should be filled with his word. Now, many of you do this. You go to your house and you have uh, Bible verses and these cute little signs and these little things hanging up on your wall. It's the same concept. It's just having the word of God in front of you. Because here's an interesting principle. Whatever is in front of us, we're going to think about. That's why people spend $2 million on Super Bowl ads. Because whatever is in front of you, you're going to think about. So God says, I want my word to be in front of you. Because if my word is in front of you, you're going to be thinking about it. Now, um, they, Orthodox Judaism can legalize uh, this stuff and legalisticalize this stuff and uh, make it completely miss the point. But there's not a bad thing about using reminders in our lives to remind ourselves about the word of God. Verse 10 goes on to say, oh, good. We might finish chapter 6 tonight. He says, So it shall be when the Lord your God brings you into the land of which he swore uh, to your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give you large and beautiful cities uh, which you did not build, houses full of all good things which you did not fill, hewn out wells uh, which you did not dig, vineyards and olive trees which you did not plant, When you have eaten and are full, verse 12, then beware lest you forget the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. Interesting. He goes, I'm getting ready to lead you into a land. And you're going to be able to stay in houses you didn't build. You're going to be able to drink from wells you didn't drill. You're going to be able to reap the benefits of the hardworking people of, of, of another culture. And he says, I'm blessing you in that, but you better be careful Verse 12, beware because you're liable to forget about me. Before we talk about verse 12, the end of verse number 11 says, when you have eaten and are full. And many Jewish homes today, they'll actually pray at the end of the meal. After they've eaten, after they're filled, then they thank God for the food. And it's because of verses like this. When you have eaten and are filled, uh, in their mind, they go, why would you pray before? Eat first, get full, and then thank God uh, for it. So anyway, I just thought I'd point that out to you. But verse 12, when he gives them this warning, man, you better be careful because prosperity can result in complacency. Prosperity can cause us to become complacent, and God warns his people of this. In Ezekiel chapter 16, verses 49 through 50, uh, we learn about the sin of Sodom. And he says, look, this was the iniquity of your sister Sodom. She and her daughters had pride, fullness of food, abundance of idleness, and neither did she strengthen the hand of the poor and needy. And they were haughty and committed abominations before Uh, I took them away as I saw fit. Sodom and Gomorrah was guilty of a lot of stuff. Homosexuality, terrible things, abominations before the Lord. But the thing that did them in is that ultimately they became complacent. And and this is an interesting list that the Lord gives. Look, this was the iniquity of your sister Sodom. She and her daughters had pride, fullness of food, abundance of idleness, Neither did she strengthen the hand of the poor and needy. Now, every time I read this verse, I can't help but point out to you guys, what if you took out the the, the city of Sodom and you just put it in, I don't know, maybe like the United States of America in there? What if we read it like this? And this is the sin of the United States. 
She had her, she was full of pride. Is there any more prideful group of people on the earth besides maybe, this will sound bad, besides Greek people, then uh, Greeks are pretty prideful. Besides Greek, then the United States, I mean, we are just very prideful. We're full of pride. We have fullness of food. Probably everyone's fridge here has food that you're going to throw away because it's going to go bad. Fullness of food, abundance of idleness. Not necessarily just idolatry, but idleness meaning too much time on your hands. Most people only work 40 hours a week. What are you doing with the rest of your week? Getting into trouble, that's what you're doing, right? Most of Americans get into trouble because they have an abundance of idleness. Neither did she strengthen the hand of the poor and needy. And again, we can be guilty of that as well as a nation at large. We're not concerned about the less fortunate. God says, I don't like that kind of stuff, so we better be careful. He warns his people, careful when you go into the land because it's going to be really, really good, but you're liable to forget about me. Verse 13, he says, you shall fear the Lord your God and serve him and shall take oaths in his name. And you shall go after and you shall not go after other gods, the gods of the people who are all around you. When you get into the land, don't try to adopt their religious systems. Verse 15, for the Lord your God is a jealous God among you, uh, lest the anger of the Lord lest the anger of the Lord your God be aroused against you and destroy you from the face of the earth. You shall not tempt the Lord your God as you tempted him in Massa. Now, that word Massa actually means tempted. And this is where Jesus quoted from in Matthew chapter 4, verse 7, when Satan was tempting Jesus after he fasted for 40 days. Remember, Jesus says, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. Quoting from Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 16. Verse 17, he says, you shall... Uh, diligently keep the commandments of the Lord your God, his testimony and his statutes, which he has commanded you, and you shall do what is right and good in the sight of the Lord, that it may be well with you, and that you may go in and possess the good land which the Lord swore to you and your fathers, to cast out all your enemies from before you as the Lord has spoken. Verse 20, when your sons ask you in time to come, saying, What is the meaning of the testimonies and the statutes and the judgments which the Lord our God has commanded you? Then you shall say, verse 21, to your sons, We were slaves of Pharaoh in Egypt, and the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand. In verse 20, Moses lets the people know the time is going to come when your sons are going to ask you, Mom, Dad, why do we do this? Why do we celebrate Passover? Why do we make a big deal about the Shema? Why do we go to church every Sunday? Why do we come to church on Wednesday nights? You guys who have had kids know that those questions happen in the minds and hearts of kids. One day they're going to ask, Mom and Dad, why are we doing what we're doing? The Lord says, you got to be ready to give an answer. And the answer is, well, you see, because we were once slaves in Egypt and God let us out because he loved us. Because he loved us. He showed us another way of life, and we're going to do our best to try to live by that. I find this interesting because it's so important, and I talk about this quite a bit, but it's so important for us as a church culture to understand the importance of investing in um, the little ones, the younger ones. And it's, um, it's a big deal because the, the number one answer that kids get from their parents when they want to do something or ask questions, is I don't have time right now. That's just how it is in our country and in our world today. I don't have time, or not right now. And that shouldn't be the answer that we should be giving. We are extremely busy people. I understand that. But as a, as a people, we need to do our best to understand the importance of taking time to just talk to the younger ones. Uh, this is something that the, the Lord, uh, in my personality, in my heart, allows me to do naturally, but I, I, and even though it's natural to me, I do it intentionally. I, I, w- I would much rather, I can have a lot going on in this brain of mine. There's a lot of things that can take place on a Wednesday night or a Sunday morning, and people are sharing with me different things, and they're letting me know that so-and-so has cancer, or so-and-so has just died, or they're trying to find this thing or do that thing, and I got to teach on Revelation, all this stuff is happening. But if a little one comes up to me and they want to tell me something, I'm going to, I'm going to get down on my knees and I'm going to listen to what they have to say. Because what we talked about a few weeks ago, don't let what's um, urgent get in the way of what's important. And those little ones are important. Anyway, verse 21, he says, Then you shall say to your sons, We were slaves uh, of Pharaoh in Egypt, 
And the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand. And the Lord showed signs and wonders before uh, our eyes, great and severe against Egypt. Pharaoh and all his household. Man, God delivered us from Egypt. He showed many signs in order to do that. Deuteronomy 6, verse 23, a great verse. It says, then he brought us out from there that he might bring us in to give us the land which he swore to our fathers. God brought them out so that he could bring them in. And that's the truth for you and me as well. God doesn't just bring us out for the sake of bringing us out. He didn't bring them out of Egypt so they could stay in the wilderness. He brought them out of Egypt so that he could bring them into the promised land. And God brings us out. He calls us out from the world because he wants us to be walking in uh, the fullness of his blessings. He wants us to be faithfully following him. He brought us out so that he could bring us in. Verse 24, and the Lord commanded us to observe all these statutes, to fear the Lord our God, for our God, for, for our good always, that he might preserve us alive as it is this day. God gave us these commandments, verse 24 says, so that we could observe them, these statutes, so we fear the Lord. Why? For our good always. The purpose of God setting up these perimeters for his people is for their good. It reminds me of a quote um, that I heard right after I first got saved. Sin is not bad because it's forbidden. It's forbidden because it's bad. Jesus doesn't say, um, I don't want you to do this. That makes it bad. No, this thing is bad. And Jesus says, I don't want you to do this. Everything that God tells us to abstain from or to be exercising in is for our good how long always for our good always when we do things God's way it's because he wants it for our good and he wants it for our good always verse 25 it says then it will be a righteousness for us if we are careful to observe all these commandments before the Lord our God as he has commanded us Man, it's going to be righteousness for us as we walk in our obedience uh, to the things that the Lord has told us to do, Moses tells the people. Deuteronomy chapter 6, pretty famous uh, chapter dealing there in verse 4. Really good stuff to kind of read over and even pray in our own lives. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And just that great reminder that you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. Jesus, what's the greatest commandment? The greatest commandment is to be in love with God. That's what we ought to be doing. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, thank you for this evening that you blessed us with. Um, God, thank you for uh, the time that we uh, got to spend together, um, Lord, looking at Deuteronomy 5 and 6 and just uh, reviewing the Ten Commandments. Lord, thank you that they are a mirror. Lord, that they show us that we fall short, that we're messed up. But Lord, I also thank you that they're not the remedy. Jesus, I thank you that you are that your sacrifice, that your blood is what cleanses us. Lord, it's what makes us beautiful. Lord, we can't brush our hair with a mirror. Lord, we can just see that our hair needs brushed by the mirror. And Lord, then we, then we apply the thing that needs to be done. Lord, your, your law points us to you. What a beautiful truth that is. Lord, I thank you that you are true, that you are eternal, that you are the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob of Israel, Lord, that you are one God. Um, Lord, as we see manifested in the New Testament as a Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Um, Lord, what, a, what an interesting thing for our finite minds, Lord, to try to wrap our head around. But Lord, we see even back in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4, uh, the, 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 the hint is there. Lord, in the, in the grammar, it's found that there's more to you than, than appears. Lord, you are so much deeper, so much greater than we are. And thank you that we are not able to fully wrap our mind around you, God, because if we were able to fully understand you, God, you wouldn't be worthy of worship. Lord, there's a mystery to you. For all eternity, we're going to be in awe and amazement and trying to figure out just one more aspect of you, Lord. Um, so thank you for that. God, fill us with your spirit. Thank you for your word. Thank you that you brought us out so you could bring us in. Lord, Lord, you set us free. You delivered us from a life in Egypt, a life of bondage to sin and, and 
addiction and whatever people struggle with, God, for me, it was religion. God, you set us free from a life of those things so that you could bring us in, Lord, to the life that you have planned for us. And God, I pray that we would be a group of people that realizes that the most important commandment, Lord, is that we're in love with you. Lord, it's hard to be in love with someone that you don't spend time with. So God, may we be a group of people that spend time with you. Lord, that as we come near to you, we will hear you as you spoke to Moses. God, thank you for your people. God, I just pray that you would bless them. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.